been going through the book of Joshua, which is the Old Testament. And today, the title of the lesson, The Promised Land of Dreams. Turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis 15. Genesis literally means the beginning, amen? So that's what we're going to look at a little bit here today, is the beginning of the promise, the beginning of the dream. And God appears to Abram. And he tells him that his descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky, as numerous as the grains of sand on the seashore. And he says in verse 12, as the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country, not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years but I will punish the nation they serve as slaves. And afterward, they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. God appears to Abraham and gives Abraham a vision. He plants the seed of a dream in Abraham's heart. And he says, your people will inherit the land where you are right now. But before that happens, for 400 years, you'll be slaves in Egypt. And on the fourth generation, you'll be brought out of Egypt, out of slavery by my mighty hand. And your descendants will come and dispossess the Amorites of this land says the Amorites, their sin has to come to full measure. So there was a waiting period. And really it was a period of grace where God allowed some time for the potential repentance of the Amorites. Of course, that was not to happen. Exodus chapter 3. Moses is born in Egypt and raised in the palace of Pharaoh, given a royal education, given many talents and skills to lead. And yet God had a vision for Moses, a dream that he would deliver his people through the hand of his servant. And in Exodus chapter 3, verse 7, on the mountain of God, he appears to Moses through the burning bush. And it says, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. And I am concerned about their suffering. Isn't it encouraging to know that God is concerned? that God will condescend and come to us in our time of need, that he'll stoop down low to lift us up. Verse 8, I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land and into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The promised land of dreams. Point number one, living the dream. You know, as disciples of Jesus Christ, every day is a dream. I really appreciated Corey and Leslie welcoming us in and saying, you can be filled with either grief or you can be filled with joy and the choice is ours. And as disciples, we've made the choice to live the dream. Go over to Exodus chapter 33. The people are delivered, the hand of Moses, and they're led to cross the Red Sea And then they start to wander around in the wilderness. Now, this was supposed to take about a year so that they would be prepared to go in and conquer the promised land. It's been two years. And here in Exodus 33, we find again the call, the promise is reaffirmed by God. The Lord says to Moses, leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go up to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. So it's been two years, and the time now is for the Israelites to cross the Jordan River and to go in and conquer that good land. Now pick it up in verse 7. We'll find out what it takes to really live the dream. Verse 7 Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp, and whenever Moses went out to the tent, 
all the people rose and stood up at the entrances to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshiped, each at the entrance of his own tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. What does it take to live the dream? We find where the dream really begins in Moses' heart and really in our hearts as well, our time with God. And Moses' time with God, his quiet time was a sacred moment. And when Moses got up and walked to the tent of meeting, it said all the other Israelites would stand at the entrance of their tent and watch and wait until Moses entered to convene with the Most High God. And it was there that he'd have communion with God. It was there that he'd have fellowship with God. It was there that he would get the dream and the strength and the will to lead the people across the Jordan. You know, God wants us to wrestle with him. Turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 32. All of us are here because we want to be here. Amen. We're here not because we were convinced by some person, but because we were convinced by God. And in Genesis 32, I want to introduce you to really what is our heritage, our pedigree as a movement, as a people. In verse 22, it says, That night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his 11 sons and crossed the fort of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. You know, Jacob, being one of the uh, patriarchs of Israel here, has to begin to deal with his life. Jacob had some sins that were undealt with. Jacob literally means one who grasps the heel, which was an idiom for one who deceives. And the heel has always been associated with evil. Uh, for example, in the WWF or something like that, you find that there's the hero and the heel, the people that everybody loved to hate. Amen? Amen. It's the enemy. It's the villain. This who, Jake, this who Jacob, this is who he was before he wrestled with God. So he's following God, but then he goes into this wrestling match that lasts all night long with the pre-incarnate Jesus. Wow. Wrestling with the angel of the Lord. Now, it's incredible because this happens only after he sends his wives across, of whom he had four. He sends his children across the river, 12. He sends all his possessions and all the livestock. And, and who's he with? but himself. He's there alone and he's wrestling with God, just like Moses was in the tent of meeting. Well, let's see what happens. It says, when the man saw that he could not overpower him. Now, this is the man, Jesus Christ, could not overpower Jacob, not because he was limited in his strength, but because Jacob would not quit. There was no quit in Jacob. Wow. And it says that he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. And the man said, all right, enough, let me go, it's daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with man and have overcome. You know, right here, Jacob goes through this identity shift. He gets a new name. He gets a new lease on life. And he goes from being one who deceives to one who struggles and overcomes. Isn't this incredible? Yeah. Now, he's wrestling with God. He won't let God go. And God says, I got to go. I've got another appointment. Let me go. He says, I will not let you go. Now, you got to understand that his hip was already wrenched. God had already dislocated his hip. Amen. Wow. So he's already injured, and yet he's still not blessed. And God says, let me go. And once Jacob refuses to let go, it's then that God gives him a blessing. You know, what's incredible is that if you go to God and you wrestle with him, everybody that tussles with the Lord will walk away limping, yeah. but not everybody will walk away blessed. Right. Jacob wrestles with God. He gets injured, which happens sometimes, but he still refuses to let go. And that's exactly what God was looking for. He says, only when you persevere, only when you really look inside and deal first with yourself, and then deal with me. Will you walk away a new creation? Wow. And this is what Jacob does. He's no longer Jacob, but Israel. 
You know, as Ethan was studying the Bible, we got together on Monday. Now, Ethan's a, a, a big dude, amen? And he's convinced he can beat me in wrestling. I'm also convinced that he can beat me in wrestling, amen? And we got together on Monday, and he's very inspired. He's excited about salvation. He's excited about baptism. He's excited to have his sins forgiven. And I sat down, I said, Ethan, you're not ready. He's like, what do you mean? He got a little angry, kind of got up on the edge of his seat, and I kind of backed up a little bit. I feel like I'm about to wrestle with the angel of the Lord right here. I said, I don't, I don't know what it is, but there's just, you're not, you're not fully convinced. You're excited about salvation, but you got to be a disciple. You've got to go look inside, and you've got to wrestle with God. Because in your current state, you could get baptized, but then maybe there's a bigger influence in your life. Maybe there's something stronger in your life that comes and takes you away. Because you were convinced to a certain extent, but you haven't yet been fully convinced through and through by the Lord himself. Amen. And he's a little agitated, amen? amen. But he says, I want to do it. I got to go figure it out. So a couple days go by, and he texts me. He says, I figured it out. Amen. I got it. And he, by himself, in a car, was screaming, yelling, and praying to God. Amen. Until he got and he showed up a completely different person. The true disciple, nothing can scare them. The true disciple, nothing can convince them other than God and his word. There's nothing that can shake the man of God, the woman of God. For they have been convinced by God himself. There's no opposition, no persecution, no trial, no financial hardship, no sickness that will separate them from the one who they love. Right. You know, John chapter 6, verse 44, Jesus says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. You see, you want to bear fruit that lasts, they've got to be taught by God. They've got to be drawn by God. He says himself, it is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Yeah. When you are taught by God, even if you do fall, you come on back home all the time, don't you? Yeah. And I believe that Ethan's baptism today is one a young man who has been taught by God. Yeah. And the same with Wedline. You know, I talked to Wedline on Monday night, and she wasn't quite there, and the sisters got in there, and you just can't help but see how radiant she is this morning. She's so fired up. Turn your Bible to Zechariah chapter 8. Zechariah chapter 8. Right here in verse 18. It says, again, the word of the Lord Almighty came to me. This is what the Lord Almighty says. The fasts of the fourth, fifth, seventh, and tenth months will become joyful and glad occasions and happy festivals for Judah. Therefore, love truth and peace. You know, to fast means to not eat. I don't know about you, but I'm not really crazy about that idea. Amen? Amen. I fast every night. When I go to sleep, I wake up and I break my fast. Are you with me right there? It's been a solid few hours since I ate. Try to cut it off 7.30. Wake up 5.36. About time to go. Thank you, God. Bless that fast. Amen? Now, the idea of... of for you know, days on end, not eating doesn't really fire me up. I don't get really excited about that. That sounds like a really painful idea. Yeah. And yet, for the man of God, the woman of God, it says even the fasts, they turn into festivals. Because you got something even better than food. Right. Something even better than alcohol. Yeah. Better than sleep. Yeah. Better than sex. Yeah. Better than anything that the world goes to to find comfort. Better than money. Better than success. It says our, our joy is, is greater than when their vats overflow with blessings. Our joy is like if you had just won the lottery, you'd be so fired up. Are you with me? Wouldn't that solve some problems? Like, let's be honest. If I gave you a million dollars cold cash, how would you feel right now? I don't know about you. I'd be real fired up. Like, thank you very much. <laughs> pay the car note. Pay the mortgage. Go buy a big truck. I'm, I'm happy. Thank you. It says that's how we live every day because of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Even the fast turn into festivals. You know, we love coming to church as disciples. Yeah. Yeah. A Sunday morning's a celebration. Yeah. 
you know, before I became a disciple, I'd go to church. You know, a lot of churches, amen. Yeah. Not a lot of disciples. Yeah. And I'd go to church and I'd sit in the pew and the next closest person was like 10 people away. Now, there wasn't any, anybody in between us. Wow. 10 spots away. And I remember, I'll never, I'll never forget it. I sat down, another guy about 10 feet away, kind of leaned over and waved like that. I said, this is not the kingdom of God. This is not it. On Sunday, Malcolm X said, 11 o'clock Sunday morning is the most segregated hour of the week. And in the world, what do you find? Black churches, white churches, Korean churches, Mexican churches, but in God's kingdom, all nations. And, And everybody's excited about coming to church. They like the songs. They love hearing the word, you know, but it's not just Sunday. Every Wednesday night, we're fired up to be at midweek. The fast turns into a festival. I mean, could you imagine before you became a disciple that you'd be doing what you're currently doing? As a matter of fact, you were actively avoiding all of that, weren't you? And yet here you are, a soldier for Christ. Look at what it says here. In verse 20, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Many peoples and the inhabitants of many cities will yet come. And the inhabitants of one city will go to another and say, let's go at once to entreat the Lord and seek the Lord Almighty. I myself am going. And many peoples and powerful nations will come to Jerusalem to seek the Lord Almighty and to entreat him. Let's just go up together to worship God. Let's go seek God. Let's go pray together. Let's entreat the Lord and go to Jerusalem. Verse 23, this is what the Lord Almighty says in those days, 10 men from all languages and nations, will take firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe and say, let us go with you because we have heard that God is with you. Is that not incredible? When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, when you're fired up about what God is doing in your life, says 10 people will come and take a hold of your robe and say, please take me with you. I heard there's a church over at USF at the MSC and I, I can see it's not like any church. I can see that you're not like any religious person I've met. I can see that there's a difference. And I want you to take me to Bible talk. I want you to take me to Sunday service so that I can have what you have. Can you imagine baptizing 10 people this year? You? That's like 700 baptisms this year. If everybody in the church baptized 10 people, That's 700 baptisms. Is my math wrong on that, Ralph? Okay. This is, I want what you have. It eludes me. When I came to church, from a worldly perspective, I felt like I had done at least more than my peers and the guys that had, you know, wanted me to kind of hang out and study the Bible. And I sort of looked down on them, but then I quickly realized that even though from a worldly perspective, I had sort of kind of outpaced them. I felt totally hollow. I was like a shell. And yet here were these younger men who could see right through me. It scared me and it inspired me. I mean, I was nervous. They were, hey, well, what do you think about Sunday service? I was like, yes, I'll study the Bible. I was like, what? What did I just say? And I agreed. And then two and a half weeks later, I was baptized. This was the dream. One Jew. 10 people, one disciple, 10 people. You know, Numbers 13, Moses brings the people up to the border of the promised land. It's been two years. They're supposed to cross over. He sends 12 spies, 10 come back and make the hearts of the people melt with fear. Only two had a faithful response, Joshua and Caleb. It took 38 more years because of the faithlessness of the people. What was supposed to take one year lasted 40 Now, Joshua came to power. They crossed the Jordan. They conquered Jericho. They had some setbacks and some mistakes because they forgot to pray, amen? And yet God forgave them and acted on their behalf. You remember last Sunday where he was throwing hailstones, defeating the army. Let's pick it up in Joshua chapter 10. Living the dream. Joshua chapter 10. In verse 16. It says, now the five kings had fled and hidden in the cave of Makeda. When Joshua was told that the five kings had been found hiding in the cave of Makeda, he said, roll large rocks up to the mouth of the cave and post some men there to guard it. But don't stop. Pursue your enemies, attack them from the rear, and don't let them reach their cities, for the Lord your God has given them into 
your hand. These five kings were the confederation that had formed against Joshua and the Israelites. And these were the kings that Joshua conquered. Verse 22, they rout the armies, and then it picks up here. It says, Joshua said, open the mouth of the cave and bring those five kings out to me. So they brought the five kings out of the cave, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon. When they had brought these kings to Joshua, he summoned all the men of Israel and said to the army commanders who had come with him, come here, and put your feet on the necks of these kings. So they came forward and placed their feet on their necks. Joshua said to them, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Be strong and courageous. This is what the Lord will do to all the enemies you are going to fight. Then Joshua struck and killed the kings and hung them on five trees, and they were left hanging on the trees until evening. At sunset, Joshua gave the order, and they took them down from the trees and threw them into the cave where they'd been hiding. At the mouth of the cave, they placed large rocks, which are here to this day. That day, Joshua took Makeda. He put the city and its king to the sword and totally destroyed everything in it. He left no survivors. And he did to the king of Makeda as he had done to the king of Jericho. You know, the armies are routed. Then Joshua goes to the cave where these kings are hiding. He says, take away the stone and bring them out. They know it's about to happen. And he, as the king, in essence, from a worldly perspective, as the leader of God's people, it was customary that he would come to the kings that had been defeated and he would place his feet on their necks to make it clear that he had overcome. But he changes course and he brings the commanders of the people with all the people present, the commander's representative of the people of Israel. And he says, you put your feet on their necks. Why? Because it wasn't about Joshua. It was never about one man. It was about God being glorified and all his people being used by him. Amen. The commanders put their feet on the necks of the enemies. God was with his people. All the people. And they were with God because they had obeyed the command to leave no survivors. Now that sounds like a gruesome command, doesn't it? It sounds ungodlike. And what's wild is that God did not become a Christian in the New Testament, amen? Right. Right. The God of Joshua is yeah. the same God that we have today. Yeah. And we have the same command to leave no survivors. Why was the command given? Because... Had they left survivors, these people would later become a snare to the Israelites and then drag them away to their gods. There would be the revenge motive of family members left behind that would then attack the Israelites. The command was simple, but not easy. Leave no survivors. It's used eight times in chapter 10 as they conquer the southern cities, six times in chapter 11 as they conquer the northern cities. Look at Joshua chapter 11, verse 21. It says, at that time, Joshua went and destroyed the Anakites, from the hill country, from Hebron, Debir, and Aneb, from all the hill country of Judah, and from all the hill country of Israel. Joshua totally destroyed them and their towns. No Anakites were left in Israelite territory, only in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod did any survive. So Joshua took the entire land, just as the Lord had directed Moses, and he gave it as an inheritance to Israel, according to their tribal divisions. Then the land had rest from war. You know, it says that the Anakites were conquered by Joshua. Well, who were the Anakites? They were the ones that struck fear into the hearts of the Israelites because they were giants. These were huge people with large and fortified cities. And Joshua makes a note here at the end. He says, oh yeah, the giants, I took them out too, but not all of them. Some of them were left in Gath. And of course, who's the most famous giant of all to come from Gath? Goliath. You see, that's what happens when you leave survivors. Now, for us, we understand this in spiritual terms, that we need to deal completely with our sin. Yeah. We can leave no stone unturned. And something that you neglect in the beginning will become a giant for you in the end. Wow. Procrastination are the leaders of tomorrow, amen? And we, lead, we need leaders today. Amen. It says you cannot leave stuff undone. You've got to make it happen. I want to put before you to deal with your life today. If you're visiting with us, study the Bible because that thing that you're ignoring, and I know you know what I'm talking about, will become a Goliath for you. Joshua took them out, but not all of them. Live the dream. Point number two, keep the dream alive. In Joshua chapter 14, you've got the story of Caleb. Look at what it says here in chapter 14 in verse 6. Now the men of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Jephna, the Kenizzite, said to him, you know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. 
I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my brothers who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of all your children forever, because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses. While Israel moved about in the desert, so here I am today, 85 years old. I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. Amen. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephna, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Jephna, the Kenizzite, ever since, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. Hebron used to be called Kiriath Arba, after Arba, who was the greatest man among the Anakites. Then the land had rest from war, keeping the dream alive. You know, Caleb was 85 years old. He was given a promise when he was 40. How about that for patience? 45 years waiting on God. And he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to give me the hill country. Now, the King James is cool because he says, literally, give me this mountain. Caleb, you know, what's incredible is that the spies, when they spied out the land, actually separated. And Caleb was the one that went up to what was Kiriath Arba to spy it out and saw the Anakites. This was the most challenging section of the promised land. And he tells Joshua, I want you to give me this mountain. I want you to give me the most challenging job that you have. Why? Because the most challenging job will bring the most exciting rewards. Nothing in life is easy. And nothing worth getting is easily gotten. And he says, I want you to give me the mountain where the giants live. It's not just the people that are huge. Their cities are huge. And the cities are fortified. It's Kiriath Arba. Well, what was Kiriath Arba? You see, this was a special place, which is why it was so protected by the enemy. This was where the cave was that Abraham bought to bury his wife, Sarah. He was later himself buried in Kiriath Arba. So was Isaac and Jacob. This was the most sacred plot of ground in all of Canaan. It was the most heavily guarded. You see, Satan does not want us to make disciples. Satan does not want our church to grow. Satan does not want you to overcome your own sin. And he will heavily fortify those places in your life. And Caleb says, listen, I'm 85 years old, but I've got just as much strength and vigor as when I was 40. Maybe not as physically strong, but I'm just as fired up. You know, I appreciate the older brothers in the church, amen? And you know what? They might not be young men anymore, but they can outwork any of the young campus brothers. They've got zeal. They've got passion. And they've got fire. And Caleb says, I will not back down from a challenge. Give me this mountain. You know, we've been given the same command. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus tells the disciples, go to Jerusalem, to Galilee and Samaria, to Judea, and to all the ends of the earth. Leave nobody out. Everybody must hear. Look over at Colossians chapter 1, verse 23. Colossians chapter 1, verse 23. This is about 33 years after the church had begun in Acts chapter 2. Paul, really the premier leader of the church there in the first century, pens this letter about 62 AD. Colossians chapter 1, in verse 23, the mission was simple. Leave no survivors. Leave no stone unturned. Leave nobody out. Preach to them all. And in verse 23, he says, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. You see, in the Old Testament, they were to leave no survivors. And in the New Testament, the call was the same to leave no survivors. And for us today, it's the same mission. Amen. 
Leave nobody behind. Tell everybody about the good news so that 10 of them grab a hold of your robe and say, take me with you. You know, God has a dream. He wants the whole world evangelized. He wants nobody left behind. As a father, if my children were lost, I'd have but one concern, to find them. And I would not stop until they were found. This is God's heart. He is our father. You know, sometimes we think about being lost as sort of a punishment for our sin. But if you've ever lost somebody, if you've ever lost something, you ever lost your children in a supermarket? You know, I forget uh, a couple years ago when my oldest was about four or five, and I was standing there at the produce section in the grocery store, and she's right there, and I'm picking out some avocados or whatever it was, and I look, and then she's not there, and I start turning around, and she was just kind of behind me doing this, you know? (laughs) But it doesn't take much for my heart to just literally sink to the floor. I cannot lose my child. That's all I care about. There's nothing that my children could do that would make me love them less. Now, it doesn't mean their behavior is acceptable. Are you with me? And and a a loving parent will discipline their child. Spare the rod. Amen. You know, God loves us. It doesn't mean our behavior is acceptable. But he will stop at nothing, even to sending his own son until we were found. You know what it takes to evangelize the world? Two things, preaching and persecution. How did they evangelize the world? Let's look at Acts chapter 19. We're almost there, guys. Acts 19, I know it's late. It's the Pro Bowl today. Nobody watches the Pro Bowl, amen? (laughs) Acts chapter 19. Verse 8, right here, Paul entered the synagogue, spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe the way and publicly maligned the way. A little bit of persecution. A little bit, uh, they don't like Paul. They don't like him. They hate him, as a matter of fact. Paul didn't care. So Paul leaves, takes with him the disciples, and has daily discussions in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and the Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. In two years, Paul, with 12 nameless, faceless disciples of no name, of no real significance, 12 of them in two years with no cell phone, no car, no technology, no social media, evangelized all of minor Asia, which is the western half of modern-day Turkey, an area the size of California. Everybody heard. Why? Why? Because of persecution and preaching. You see, persecution never stops us from preaching, amen? And preaching always causes persecution. Point number three, they hated the dreamer. Why did they hate Paul so much? Because they always hated the dreamer. In Genesis 37, we find the story of Joseph. Joseph was loved by his father. So much so that he was given a coat of many colors. And his brothers hated him because he was loved so much by his dad. I mean, his dad was a little unspiritual. Like, you should probably try to be a little impartial right there with your kids, amen? Like, here's the coat of many colors for my favorite. I mean, for you. (laughs) And here's something for you. What was your name again? I mean, you had 12 of them, amen? This is his brother just hated him. And then Joseph's given a dream. And then he was foolish. He goes and tells his brothers about it. He says, I had this dream that all of you will bow down to me. (laughs) And they hated him all the more. They despised him. Why? The dreamers always hated. You know, Lincoln, five days after the treaty was signed in Appomattox, Virginia, that ended the Civil War, was assassinated. Why? Because they hated the dreamer. Gandhi practiced peaceful resistance and yet was felled by a bullet. Why? Why? because they hated the dreamer. JFK murdered in the street because they hated the dreamer. Martin Luther King had a dream that ended in a nightmare because they hated the dreamer. They hated Paul. Why? Because the greatest dreamer of all was Jesus Christ. All of these 
secular heroes pale in comparison to the author of dreams. Look over at John chapter 15. You know, many of us have a, a, a false version of Jesus in our minds. A, a frail man, a borderline effeminate man, an emaciated man who walks around with a, a, a little lamb and sort of like has this look like, Now, you would not hate somebody who could do you no harm. You would not hate somebody who would be blown over by a stiff wind. And yet Jesus was a force to be reckoned with. Lest we forget that he was arrested at three in the morning. Dragged out with torches and clubs. Taken to court. Condemned to death. And executed publicly. Naked and penniless. You see, there's no way to soften that message. Look at what it says in John 15. Here he is in verse 18. If the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. Well, there you go, amen. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. This is why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. There is literally no way to make Christianity cool. If I could get into a pair of skinny jeans, if I could sing and dance, it would still not be cool, amen? And none of that's ever going to happen, all right, guys? There is no way, you know, these YouTube churches, these, these modern churches, it's a business model. They get the right logo. They get the branding right. They put it out. They pay for the publications on Facebook. Let me tell you something. The world was evangelized in 30 years in the first century without any of that. But let me tell you something. I think it can get in the way. So much so that God will take it away from us so that we remember the only thing we really need is his Holy Spirit, the word of God, and faith. Amen? Amen. This is, this is, no, no servant is greater than, than his master. If they executed me, if they hated me, if they persecuted me, what do you think they're going to do to you? And all of his lessons, he, he doesn't explain it. He just lays it on out right there. John chapter 6, he says, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And all the people are like, what? He says, well, let me explain to you what that means. No, he didn't do that. He says, does this offend you? Yeah. Yeah. I know you already know my words don't count for anything. They're just flesh. The flesh counts for nothing. Yeah. My words are spirit. Yeah. He says, I know you know what I mean, but you don't want to know. Yeah. You don't want to obey. On, he goes on and he says, if they persecuted me, They'll persecute you also. If they obey my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now, however, they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen these miracles, and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this was to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. What do we learn from Jesus? Haters going to hate. There's, there's literally nothing you can do about it. You cannot appeal to a hater. You, and God forbid, God forbid that we lower the lamp of God's glow to be more acceptable to a hater. Jesus said, haters going to hate. And the flyer I get, the worse the hate becomes. I saw Brandon walk in this morning, a little, little hate in my heart. I'm like, I wish I could look that fly. Look at that hair. But it looks like his family members are right there with me, amen? Maybe the blessing skipped a generation right there. Haters gonna hate, what can I say? God wants us to dream. He wants us to live the dream. Amen. Keep the dream alive. Yeah. Remember, they hated the dreamer. He wants us to dream big. The question is, in our fourth point, can you drink the cup? Wow. Look over at Mark chapter 10 as we bring it in for a landing here. Mark chapter 10. In verse 35, it 
says here, then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. That's pretty bold right there. That's quite a dream. You know, I got an idea. I'm just going to walk straight up to Jesus in front of everybody. Say, I want you to do for me whatever I request. I think even some of us would be offended by that. The other disciples, the 10 other guys, are like, what? How dare they? Oh, they're going to get it. Jesus is going to lay them out. Be humble. Back down. Sit in the back, because that's where humble people sit. Let's see what he says. What do you want me to do for you? Oh! Now the other 10 are like, oh, I should have asked him the same thing. I think we so misunderstand Jesus. He's fired up. I mean, don't you want your kids to be bold? Don't you want them to be confident? Don't you want them to go after things in their life, to be told no by no one? And Jesus here, he says, what do you want me to do? I'm interested. This is, this is exciting. They replied, they didn't get nervous. Listen to this. Let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Wow. That's pretty incredible. And Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink. And be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. So Jesus says, listen, I can't control that. I don't know if you're going to be the next evangelist, the next shepherd, the next intern, be an ICCM. It's going to be awesome. But the question for you is, can you drink the cup? Can you be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? And he says, you will. Amen. Now, where you end up, I don't know. But God is calling us to have a dream in our heart and to be willing to drink the cup of loneliness, to drink the cup of opposition, to drink the cup of awkward conversations. Amen. You know what? Being a Christian is a little awkward. Start inviting people. You know, when you go out, married's night, we're going to invite some people out to church. Amen. It's not going to be a structured thing. I appreciate Anthony. I was getting advice from him. He's like, you know, this is a great place to meet people because that's who Anthony is. Anthony shares his faith wherever he goes. Date night, great opportunity, amen? Now, and there's no way. I'm not as cool as Anthony. I, I, it's going to be awkward if I start talking to people, amen? I'm like, Bible? Church? God? No? Okay, all right. Can you drink the cup? And the answer for us, of course, is yes. You know, it goes on. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with James and John. They were so ticked off. Jesus called them together and said, you, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus does not punish their ambition. He invites ambition. As a matter of fact, nothing good happens without ambition. Now, ambition has got to be godly, and I believe that it's God that's going to ensure that it it ends up that way, even if it doesn't start that way. God says, I want you to be ambitious. I want you to dream, but I want to show you the way to greatness is through being a servant. Not living a life for yourself, but living a life and giving it as a ransom for the salvation of others. You know, Jesus was not selfless because he was sinless. He was sinless because he was selfless. He did not wait to have it all together before he lived his life and gave it as a ransom for all of us. He had his life together because that was the way that he lived. A selfless life, one of service, one of purpose. God wants us to dream. You know, if there were ever a young man among us who was a dreamer, it'd be our brother Ralph Manalo. And I'll never forget when Ralph got baptized in 2019, and it wasn't long before we sat down. He said, my dream is to become the world sector leader of the Pacific Rim world sector. And I was like, you know that job's already taken, right? Yeah. No matter. <laughs> Uh, this is an ambitious little booger. 
you know, at times when you have a leader, you, you kind of want them to challenge you a little bit. Yeah. You know, when, when uh, Joseph had a dream, he took it to his father. His father rebuked him, but it says his father kept it in his heart. He remembered. He's like, you little boy. There's something to that kid. And it's kind of been Ralph. You know, sometimes he pushes my buttons. Amen. Sometimes he thinks he knows. You know, when you're young, you don't know what you don't know. You know, the Cincinnati Bengals are in the Super Bowl. Amen. And their kicker went to University of Florida. And you know, his new nickname is Shooter McPherson. Why? Because here's this second year kicker in some of the toughest moments in the playoffs, makes 12 field goals in a row. And in the, AFC, uh, in the AFC divisional round, right before he goes out to kick the game-winning field goal, he looks over at cool Joe Burrow, and he says, looks like we're going to the AFC championship game. Goes out and nails it from 52 yards away. Wow. Is that not incredible? Cold as ice. Sheesh. <laughs> now it's the AFC championship game. It's against the Kansas City Chiefs. The game is on the line. And here comes Shooter McPherson. I'll never forget what the announcer said. He's like, he's so young. He just doesn't know what he doesn't know. Wow. That's what makes him so good. Wow. He's got no battle scars. And of course, it's coming up. He's going to miss a few. Hopefully not in the Super Bowl. Amen. amen. And then he'll know, I got to get, I got to pray to God. Oh, God, please take us to the AFC championship game. Yeah, I'll never forget a couple of Decembers ago, Ralph's like, we're going to baptize 30 people this month. <laughs> I was like, how much did you baptize last month? Zero. <laughs> what about the month before? Goose egg. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> it's like, well, the, the pattern isn't there, but I, I'm with you. Amen. I believe your faith. But the question was, can you drink the cup? Yeah. You've got great ambition. You've got a great dream. But can you drink the cup? Can you drink the cup on Wednesday at 3 p.m. alone on campus when nobody's there? Yeah. And nobody's watching. And all you want to do is curl up into a ball and take a nap. <laughs> Can you drink the cup and keep pushing? And the answer has been a definitive yes. Can you drink the cup of tough discipling, of strict training, being challenged and called higher, especially when you're doing well? And the answer has been a definitive yes. You know, Ralph's dream has always been to go to Manila and train and then plant the church in Alangapo City, where he's from. The question is, can you drink the cup? The answer has been a definitive yes. And come March 20th of this year, Ralph Manalo will be sent out to train in the full-time ministry. It's the call. That dream, that's from God. That dream that's in your heart, that's from God. Don't dim the light. Let that dream take you further than you ever thought you could go. Dream for your family. Dream for your husband. Dream for your future husband. Dream for those that you care about and that you love. Dream to go to some wild, exotic place where no Christian has ever been Amen. and to preach the word. My challenge for you is, are you living the dream or are you living for yourself? Jesus came and was selfless. He gave his life as a ransom for many. It was T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, who said, all men dream, but not equally. Those who dream by night in the dusty recesses of their minds wake up in the day to find it was vanity. But the dreamers of the day are dangerous men and women, for they may act on their dreams with open eyes and make them possible. You see, this is the promised land of dreams. God wants us to be living the dream, keeping the dream alive, knowing that they hated the dreamer 
and asking ourselves and answering with a definitive yes, can you drink the cup? I love you, and to God be the glory.